cattle produce 1.9 percent of our greenhouse gases you know so it's it's, it's a very a very small percentage and we know that if every person in the united states were to go vegan and we and we got rid of all the animals we'd have to make them animals all magically disappear the worldwide impact on greenhouse gases would be like 0.36 percent so it'd be a minuscule tiny amount for a huge huge sacrifice we would probably have and this is the thing when we take animal products out of the diet and we've seen that with you know the, the reduction in things like lard and butter and things like that that happened since the 1920s and we've seen a steady decrease things that replace that are not fruits and vegetables we see soybean oil and corn oil and we see and so what's what are we trying to replace beef with well again it's beyond meat burger it's basically canola oil and some protein isolate from peas and a bunch of artificial flavors and colors and, and, and bamboo cellulose I mean it's made out of bamboo so that is not health food so you're so he's replacing a nutritious healthy food with processed garbage Hey friends, welcome back. So today's show is brought to you by our pals over at juve.com. The leaders in photobiomodulation, which is a big scientific way to talk about how light impacts your own human biology, namely through affecting mitochondrial function and possibly through stimulating co collagen biosynthesis. My wife will tell you that it's dramatically improved her skin health at the age of 44. She doesn't need to rely upon things like facials and Botox and things like that anymore. In fact, she will tell you and I will tell you that she has not had Botox for over a year and a half since you know making the Juve photobiomodulation part of her morning routine. I use it to optimize my testosterone and hormone levels. I recommend this to all my clients. I have many doctors that I know, like, and trust that recommend this to their patients as well. I know Dr. Baker, today's podcast guest, also uses the Juve photobiomodulation. So you too can take advantage of this natural way to stimulate collagen to stimulate and help recover from soft tissue injuries and also to optimize your hormone levels right in the comfort of your own home. So please visit our show sponsor over at juve.com. That's J-O-O-V-V.com forward slash Mike. You can look at my lab work, my testosterone before and after, and I'll share it with you on that video how I use the device as well. Links are below, again, that URL, and you can also save on shipping. If you use a promo code HIH at checkout, they have some free swag for you as well over at joovv.com. Now, in today's show with Dr. Baker, I just wanna say I wanna thank Dr. Baker for all his work. He's been so consistent at helping people better understand how avoiding plant and plant anti-nutrients and going on a primarily red meat-based diet can improve your health. And I'll just be the first to tell you, and we talked about this on the podcast, when I first heard of this idea, I thought it was the dumbest thing ever. And I was very adamant and against, and I thought, gosh, this carnivore thing, how is it really impacting human biology? What about the microbiome? What about this? What about that? And I, I've been following Dr. Baker for, I'd say, a year and a half now, maybe close to two years now. And his consistency and just being un emotional about the issues and very rational and just sharing with people, you know, at the anecdotal reports and N of one stories. And it's now N of thousands, probably tens of thousands. And I had many clients, many people that have come up to me that have been on the carnivorous diet. Uh, one gentleman, in fact, in a grocery store just said, Mike, this diet changed my life. I had, you know, visceral adiposity, a big belly. I had pre-diabetes metabolic syndrome. And this was the only thing that I changed and it had a big benefit. So it's really opened my eyes and I personally have dabbled in and out of being a car strict carnivore. Uh, my wife's been doing it for now, I think 11 months. So I just wanna say, look, it's very natural to be, you know, emotionally, re to reject this idea, this idea that if you have a diet devoid of fiber and phytonutrients, that you're, there's gonna be deleterious health issues as a result of that. But I just want you to know that for some people, this can be very helpful, particularly individuals that have autoimmune disease, depression, and other neurologic disorders. So again, just hope you listen to this with an open mind. Definitely support Dr. Baker's new book launch, The Carnivore Diet, which comes out by the time you're watching this video. Uh, he's just an amazing paragon of someone who's living a healthy lifestyle at his early 50s. I mean, he's outperforming individuals in various athletic events that are half his age. Uh, and, you know, he has his own personal story that he's going to share on this podcast about he, how he lost weight um, going on this diet and how he used to eat, you know, the standard American uh, rec medical uh, recommended diets, a lot of whole grains, a lot of fiber and all that, and how that 
didn't really do him any favors metabolically and and, uh, and how going on this you know plant-free diet has impacted his health. So I really hope you enjoyed this podcast. If you do, please hit that like button, definitely subscribe to the channel, and both him and I will be following the comments below. So let's cut to it with Dr. Baker. Sean, great to be with you, bud. Thanks Mike. so much for having us right. in your home. Pleasure, yeah, pleasure. Thanks for coming out. Yeah, long time coming. You know, um, just want to want to thank you for your persistence in talking about meat and and sharing your athleticism at age 52 and you know, as someone who's been uh, doing you know powerlifting and uh, you know just deadlifting things like that, I'm, I'm always impressed with with what you're able to do. And uh, as you know, I was not a fan of the carnivorous diet at first. I was like this. You know, this thing is, is the dumbest thing ever. Why are people doing this? What about the microbiome? What about this? And I just have seen so many people benefit. And I didn't get to tell you this off camera, but I was at a PCC, it's our natural store where I shop. And uh, some guy came up to me. He's like, Mike, I love your podcast, but I'm so sick of you picking on the carnivorous diet. And he shared with me, he looked, I could just see, he looked me right in the eye, the authenticity about like how much body fat he's lost, his blood pressure. And it was like, that to me was like a slap in the face. Like, dude, people are getting results. Why are you so stuck on this microbiome thing? Anyway, so um, I feel kind of silly for like not embracing it initially, but I've been around other people and I, I'm not making excuses, but we all have these biases, right? And anyway, so thanks so much for, for just being a constant voice to helping people learn more about like an ancestral diet that we all kind of adhere to. Yeah, Mike, I mean, it's, it's interesting. And, and I would have been the same way five years ago. I mean, if you would have, if you would have approached me with the same thing, I would have said, what are you talking about? That's crazy. But I think that uh, what it is, is you just have to, at some point you have to sort of look at the results people are getting and say, well, something's here, something's yeah. going on. And, and, and now it's not, you know, one or two people, it's now tens of thousands of people that are doing this. And they're all, and by and large, they're all getting pretty good results. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, uh, uh, exciting. There's people that say that's not interesting. We should dismiss it. And I, I just have to say, you know, we have to kind of step outside the, you know, the little boxes that we put ourselves in and think, you know, maybe there's more to it than, or maybe we don't know everything. I think that's a more important thing, the concept to bring up. Which is a good, you know, vantage point to come from, right? Because we, there's, we're constantly learning. And, you know, if we could maybe start out with the microbiome thing, and I, I had a comment on one of your Instagram posts. Um, you know, uh, a fitness celebrity shared this thing and said, you know, it's like a meme about your microbiome and you, that your gut bugs are out of here on a, on a carnivorous diet. And, you know, the, the thing that a lot of people don't realize if they're not in the space is the people that benefit from the carnivorous diet are those that probably have microbiome perturbations to begin with, autoimmunity, Crohn's, colitis, depression. So that kind of stirs the, shakes the tree a little bit in that whole narrative. Yeah, I mean, that is, uh, you know, first of all, I think we really don't fully understand the microbiome yet. I mean, as, as most people, even the people that are experts at it will say, we are still very much in the infancy of the science of microbiome. And so I think it's very hard to be prescriptive about it. You know, there may be some observations you can make that these people that are generally healthy, healthy have these type of bacteria. Uh, but I think you have to, if you step back and say people that have a healthy uh, you know, general good health probably have sufficient or, or appropriate micro, microbiome. And so uh, one of the criticisms is, you know, there's not, not any fiber in a carnivorous diet. And, and while that's true, uh, we know that we can make short chain fatty acids out of amino acids. I mean, that occurs. And so the whole, you need fi fiber to make a short chain fatty acid is basically false based on that premise alone. One of the ones that often is talked about is butyrate. And we know that, you know, one of the major ketone bodies is beta hydroxybutyrate, which reversally converts to butyrate quite easily actually in the body. And so if you have circulating ketones, those circulating ketones also get to the colonocytes and you know, they get the butyrate. And so it's, it's uh, but again, at the end of the day, what is happening to people's gut function on a carnivore diet? And there are people with Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, irritable bowel syndrome, celiac disease, they're getting better. And so if, if, if you're, you know, if your uh, supposition is, a fiber deficient diet is gonna make your gut function worse, then these people should all be getting worse, not better, and that's not what we're seeing again, so. Right. They seem to get worse on more fermentable, fiber-based, plant-based foods. Right? Well, I mean, I think that's one of the, the you know, rationale behind the, the FODMAP type diet and mm -hmm. stuff. You know, we're trying to eliminate these fermentable type foods, and you know, we know that when the gut is fermenting, it's creating pressure and gas, and that's uncomfortable for a lot of people. And uh, you know, when you don't have that, that doesn't happen, and so, I have not clinically seen, in fact, I've seen people's microbiomes on a carnivore diet. So, you know, there's a fellow that had ulcerative colitis with very low diversity, he went on a carnivore diet, and he went from the third percentile up to the 95th percentile in gut diversity. And so we're seeing, you know, not what they're telling us we'd be seeing because they're not actually testing the carnivore diet. And what I'm really excited about, and I've kind of hinted to this, is there's going to be 
a major university, and I'll talk to you off camera because we don't want to say who it is yet. Uh, yeah. That's going to be, uh, you know, undergoing a, you know some of the initial carnivore diet uh, data. We're going to have something published in some pretty, yeah. uh, I think, uh, well-respected journals. So that's going to be exciting. That's okay. So is that going to be a con like an RCT kind of thing? So or? right now it's going to be a, basically an observational type type of thing. We're going to be collecting data on the people that are currently six months or more on the diet. Uh, and then from that, we'll probably turn that into intervention trials. I see. So just to get a baseline. Right. But you were part of kind of an observational study or, you know, self-reported individuals. There was an app and uh, you were talking about, uh, this was a presentation, I believe, in Colorado when you were talking about the, the stool tests. You know, the, is it the Bristol test? There's something called a Bristol s stool score where it just kind of, you did just quantifies or qualifies the, the, how your stool is. And it's, theoretically, there's... You know, it goes one through seven, and three, four, five is supposed to be ideal, and some uh, people say f a four score is, is a perfect stool, which, you know, it's kind of funny to think about, but that's, that's how people classify that. And yeah, we, we tracked that. We tracked a number of objective and subjective measures on people that did a carnivore diet for 90 days. We had something like 100 respondents that filled in data every single day they reported their data, and so we got... Uh, uh, information, you know, like we looked at the average person lost about uh, 13 kilos in 90 days, which is about th about 30 pounds, That's which is pretty interesting. We saw the average person lost about, you know, it was like eight centimeters off their waist, so we knew they were losing abdominal fat. Their heart resting heart rate went down by about eight beats per minute, which is also you know, arguably a metric of health. Uh, you know, almost across the board, everybody's either got, no one got worse, everybody got either better or significantly better with regards to knee pain, sleep quality, digestive health, uh, skin health, libido, all these things just, just you know, improved. Now, granted, self-reported, self-selected, you know, there's certainly bias in there. You can't, you know, deny that stuff. But, but anyway, that is data. Yeah, good to just get a, get a good baseline of, like, right, the pulse sure, of what, sure. it, what it could be doing. Um, but along those lines, I think, you know, there are biometric biomarkers. We see this with people that go keto that get, kind of change. For example, LDL cholesterol, uh, glucose, there's more fluctuations there. Um, you know, I, I, I feel like the carnivorous diet and the, the ketogenic diet, you know, biomarker, it, it's causing us to maybe rethink what's normal for some people that are doing these different dietary strategies. And um, where, I mean, you and uh, was it Rob Wolf, you went over your labs and things like that. So. You know, the, where I'm going with this is, is there anything people should look out for? Because most traditional doctors are not even up to speed on this. And if they see glucose rises, for example, or without changes in hemoglobin A1C, or they see LDL shifts, they're, they get pretty squirmish about that. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll touch on the LDL comment first, because we know that LDL is considered a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. And I don't think we would discount that. Now, what we would say is that, you know, what population are we studying when we look at that? And for by and large, it's people eating, you know, our standard American junk food diet, which is grain heavy, carbohydrate heavy. It's full of foods that are probably problematic. Lots of sugars, lots of, uh, you know, seed oils, which we now eat. You know, we actually eat more soybean oil than we eat uh, beef in this country right now by per calorie, which is, which is shocking. Um, we have... Uh, <laughs> That's fine. We have dogs in the background, friends, if you're not watching the video. We, we, we have, uh, uh, yeah, but so if we have this population where we, we have a, a risk factor, that's probably true in that population. But when we take out a subset of that population, so now we have people that don't have high levels of inflammation, that have good glucose control, that have low triglycerides, uh, you know, some of the other, you know, markers that are risk factors for cardiovascular disease, high, you know, visceral adiposity, liver fat, and things like that. If those things go away, we don't know if LDL is truly driving disease to the degree that it is. It may or may not be. I think that's an unanswered question. And so I think when I look at uh, someone's risk, I, you know, I think it makes sense to take in the entire package and not just myopically focus on one you know, risk factor, which you know, we, we still don't fully understand. And so I think that's part of the problem. Um, but yeah, with, with labs with regards to just in general, with ketogenic uh, uh, diets or carnivorous diets or low-carb diets in general, we often see uh, things like triglycerides going down, HDL possibly going up, LDL. It's kind of variable. Some people it goes down, some people say the same. Many people it goes up, mm -hmm. and that is concerning for, for, for many physicians and, and, and people themselves. We typically see lower, I, I typically see lower levels of, of inflammation markers, things like high-sensitivity C-reactive protein tends to drop very low 
on a carnivore diet. We often see insulin goes very low. We often see that blood glucose is very stable. I mean, I've seen a lot of con continuous glucose monitor tracings on type 1, type 2 diabetics and just regular Joes that are trying to test it out on a carnivore diet, and it's flat across the board. And so most people would argue that's a very good uh, you know, thing to have. Like, the, there's no glycemic variability. Right, more right. It's very, very stable. And so whereas, you know, many people will see uh, these postprandial spikes of, you know, using, using the U.S. metrics, you know, 150, 180, 200, yeah. and then coming back down. Uh, and then that, that probably is more problematic than, than whether it's slightly elevated but stable, I think. Yeah, and with your own labs, what have you noticed? Because uh, now you're going on year four, is that right? Or So I am. I will be three years in about two months, I'll finish three years. Okay. So I'll be starting my fourth year in December. Um, so, you know, for me, I had very low levels of inflammation. My C-reactive protein was like 0.6 or something like that. My insulin was rock bottom, it was like 2.6. Uh, my triglycerides were 53. Um, you know, my LDL cholesterol was about 140, 145. Interestingly, it, it really was unchanged. You know, I had no changes in my blood lipid panels from what I'd had several years ago. The only thing it did change was my triglycerides dropped quite a bit, yeah. which overall would be, a, would be an improvement in, sure. in the package. Now, my glucose was a little bit higher. Um, you know, I had a fasting, A1, a fasting glucose in 120s when I, when I went on the lab, and I checked it multiple times, and what I would see is it would generally somewhere range between 80, 85, 90, you know, throughout the day and in the morning it'd be a little bit higher. Um, <clears throat> interesting, after I would eat, it would often drop, mm -hmm. which is kind of the opposite of what you'd expect. Yeah, you know, it would drop good. five points or it wouldn't go. And I think because I had so much, so little insulin normally that the only time I was getting insulin was right after a meal, and then it would cause my blood glucose to drop because I'm actually seeing insulin. So um, one of the interesting things that I saw, and I've, I've talked to several people about this, is that certain athletes, particularly athletes engaging in very glycolytically demanding and particularly sprint sports on low, low carb diets, sometimes we'll see their glucose goes up. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a demand based requirement, you know, sure. for, that gluconeogenesis provides. It's almost like super compensating for that because there's, you know, the baseline is lower. Right. So that, that, that sort of makes sense. And you're only, you're doing two meals a day, correct? I would say 90% of the time I'm two meals a day. Yeah, that's sometime on a weekend. Sometimes, kids. sometimes I'll eat three. Sometimes I'll eat one. You know, it's it's like if I'm traveling, I might just eat one just because yeah. you save a little money. You know, oh, just yeah. kind of go to an all-you-can-eat steakhouse or you know, <laughs> and just load up. You know. Yeah, and you know, one vintage point or perspective that that you have um, is kind of the quality of the meat. Like, yeah, get the best that you can afford. But a lot of people are just going to Costco or Safeway, getting grain-fed this and that, and you know, with biomarkers that we can measure at present, there seems to be no, no difference. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, a, I mean, that's, a, that's a multifaceted discussion. I, I think, and I am clearly and 100% behind and I support a regenerative approach to agriculture. I think we need to do that. I think it's important for a number of reasons. I think that needs to be part of the discussion. I think when we talk about, you know, climate and impact and ethics, I think that needs to be there. And I think anybody that can support that, whether financially or just vocally needs to do that, and I certainly do that. But at the same time, um, there are a lot of people that only have a limited amount of income, and they've got to, you know, choose their dollars and what they can spend it on. And if if it comes to eating cheap processed carbohydrates versus cheap ground beef, eat the cheap ground beef any day of the week. I mean, that that that's where it is. And so I think if we want to solve or make an attempt to solve health issues in this country and other countries, you know, we've got to be able to do something that is both accessible and affordable to people. And to sit, say that, you know, this is the only way you can do it, I think is really uh, a little bit uh, counterproductive because it, it harms more people and excludes too many people. And yeah. I think, and, and honestly, at the end of the day, I mean, of the studies that have been done, Texas A&M University did a study, I think in around 2010, where they looked at ground beef that was either grain fed or grass finished, looked at some biomarkers, really no real significant difference between the two. I think, in fact, the grain fed had a slightly greater improvement in HDL, and we can argue whether that even means anything or not, probably is, is, is no significant difference. And, and that's been the clinical experience and people that I've seen. I mean, there's just as many people coming off of diabetic meds and depression meds and seeing their joint pain go away, eating the supermarket meat they, they can afford. And I think that's, again, at the end of the day, it's, the evidence should be what's in the results and not, you know, I mean, when we look at biomarkers, are we really assessing what's happening clinically? I think that's something that we have to sort of really kind of put, uh, you know, big perspective on. Yeah, that's a great point. You know, going back to the regenerative agriculture, I think that's a big 
conversation that the average person doesn't know about. They hear meat, bad for the environment, lots of water, lots of, lots of greenhouse gases. Um, you know, but, but you've been sharing some, and there's been a lot of like infographics percolating that are kind of like really putting this into perspective and context. Um, I know your book's gonna talk a lot more about this, but just for the average person, and my brother-in-law just the other day w was talking about why a couple days a week they're having Beyond Meat and this and that. He's like, yeah, it's just better for the environment. And I didn't want to get into this big whole thing, but you know, what would be kind of the elevator conversation so that the average person can convey that message to a Joe Blow that doesn't know any different? Yeah, I think it's one of the problems we have is how we frame the arguments. You know, I could say, and, and this is, if we look at the healthcare industry, for instance, the healthcare industry creates 10% of our greenhouse gases in the United States. So sick people, by proxy, create more greenhouse gases. You know, we can we could say that. So if you go on a diet, and I would argue a meat-based diet, meat -based diet is very healthy, and you create less sick people, you're actually decreasing the amount of greenhouse gases that are produced. Now, if we compare the 10% of greenhouse gases that are elicited from, from healthcare, in contrast, in the United States, and this is where you have to understand, we have to, we have to, we have to focus on our actual local region and what we can impact. Cattle produce 1.9 percent of our greenhouse gases. You know, so it's it's, it's a very a very small percentage, and we know that if every person in the United States were to go vegan, and we and we got rid of all the animals, we'd have to make the animals all magically disappear. The worldwide impact on greenhouse gases would be like 0.36 percent. So it'd be a minuscule, tiny amount for a huge, huge sacrifice. We would probably have, and this is the thing: when we take animal products out of the diet, and we've seen that with you know the, the reduction in things like lard and butter and things like that that happened since the 1920s, and we've seen a steady decrease. Things that replace that are not fruits and vegetables. We see soybean oil and corn oil, and we see. And so, what's what are we trying to replace beef with? Well, again, it's Beyond Meat Burger. It's basically canola oil and some protein isolate from peas and a bunch of artificial flavors and colors and, and, and bamboo cellulose. I mean, it's made out of bamboo. So that is not health food. So, you're, so he's replacing a nutritious, healthy food with processed garbage. It's not going to improve his health. He's probably going to more likely to harm his health. He'll contribute more to the health care system and thus the greenhouse gases from that standpoint. So, I mean, it's, it's very uh, misleading, and, and it's how you frame it. You know, we frame it just on agriculture greenhouse gases. And again, the other thing they look at is they look at it on a per caloric uh, yield. And so they say, well, we can get more calories from soybeans and corn and, and things like that than we can from beef. And that's true. The problem is the calories you get from soybeans and, and, and uh, corn and whatnot are not anywhere near as nourishing as what you can get from from things like beef, which are much higher, uh, you know, higher quality protein. We have you know essential amino acids like lysine, which are very difficult to get from plant-based sources. So you'd end up. In fact, Don Lehman did a did a uh, calculation on this, and they really, they put this in a paper, and they said we could feed approximately 25% more calories to the world by going plant-based, but we would have critical zinc, lysine, and iron deficiencies, and so you would have a population that may have more calories, it's probably fatter, mm -hmm. but they would also have nutrient deficiencies. And so it depends on how you, fr again, it's your frame of reference and how you frame the talk. And so when we let people say it's all about calories or it's all about agricultural greenhouse gases, there's more to it, there's right. more to that picture. Interesting. Um, I was gonna ask you this at the end, but it's a pertinent time to talk about it. So you, you mentioned branching amino acids, amino acids, zinc, all that. Um, I love creatine, carnitine. There's so many carnitine nutrients. Um, the name Robert Crayon, does that ring a bell to you? It does not. Okay. That, this was in the paleo diet era, you know, Lauren Cordain was out peddling these seminars and him and Robert Crayon put a lot of seminars on in Colorado and, and uh, he was like an early inspiration for me in like 2005. He was all about the carnitine nutrients. So um, what's your favorite carnitine nutrient? If you could just pick one. You know, I think carnosine is pretty interesting. I mean, carnosine is probably the most potent anti-glycating nutrient there is. I mean, you know, we worry about something called advanced glycation end products, which occur with probably too much exposure either to fructose or glucose, you know, in our bloodstream uh, and in chronic inflammation. Um, it is, you know, there's actually a paper out there that talks about it would carnosine or a carnivorous diet lead to, you know, uh, long life. You know, this is, and they've done, they've done a number of studies. It is, it has a, critical role in brain health. Uh, you know, it's something that you can only get from animal products. You know, carnitine is another one that's up there. You can get, I think you can get carnitine actually from asparagus, surprisingly, really? a very small amount. But uh, carnitine is interesting. But carnosine, carnitine, I think, are uh, extremely uh, valuable nutrients. We know that people that have 
there's a recent study looking at major depressive disorder and we saw that people that had major depressive disorder all had low levels of carnitine and we also know that people that don't eat meat in their diet have low levels of carnitine and we also see higher levels of mental health disorders in people that you know are either vegetarians or vegans and yeah. so um, so carnitine carnosine are pretty cool I mean taurine is another one that's 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 often not talked about but it has a number of uh, interesting uh, effects on the body and, and reasons to, to consume it so yeah. CoQ10. CoQ10, yes. Yeah, so that's, that's common in heart, so a lot of people like to eat, yeah, yeah, eat heart. Yeah, that's why. They, 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 <laughs> they, they, they get CoQ10, but yeah. Yeah, yeah there's, another, there's a whole bunch of things that we, they may not necessarily be essential, and some people call them conditionally essential, uh, but at the same time, they do have a benefit. They have a significant benefit, and then we're not eating them. I think we're you know, probably uh, losing out on a few things. Totally. Yeah, I'm with you. I love taurine, love talking about taurine, creatine, carnitine. I mean, all these things, are, they're super exciting. Yeah, um, creatine, it, creatine's another good one, yeah. That's oh, good. yeah. I mean, even like some of the just mental recall, mild cognitive impairment, you know, some of the studies on creatine and everything along those lines. But, you know, you hit on a good point. I think, and I think I felt into this, and I think a lot of people do, they, they kind of obfuscate or confuse issues. You know, they talk about, oh, I'm not eating meat because the environment or there's harmful things to animals. But, you know, you, you did a great job presenting at Low Carb Seattle. You said, hey, these are different issues, friends. Like if you're talking about... We need to discuss these as isolated issues and then people can pick their path, right? Um, and so can you maybe, I think it's a good mindset shift for people if you kind of convey what you're, what you're speaking about at that conference, it's helpful for people. Yeah, well, I mean, certainly I think the, you know, there's different, there's different issues and I think we have to separate human health from the health of the environment and our ethical issues. I mean, I think we first have to understand how do I individually become healthy? Because if I'm not a healthy person, I'm not going to be able to contribute, you know, properly to society. I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, like I said, tax the healthcare system, tax my own health, uh, limit what I can do productivity-wise, and so I think that's, you know, an important way to frame this. And so, um, I would argue that uh, there are ways to produce meat that actually benefit the environment, and clearly they, we can do that. And and it doesn't mean we have to change the entire system, but we we can we can have enough people doing that where they can offset some of these other things, and we know. I'm sure you're familiar with the White Oak Pasture study that came out where they show, this is Will Harris's place, I think in Georgia, where they show that they are a net carbon sink. I mean, they are, you know, when they do animals, you know, the way they do it, they're actually decreasing greenhouse gas emissions. And, you know, there's a lot of people out there that will argue that, well, maybe they're, maybe, you know, we know that uh, the methane that comes from cows, and this is the biggest argument, has not cause any appreciable rise in methane atmospherically. I mean, we've got studies looking at isotope data showing that the methane that has increased in the last 20, 30 years is not coming from cattle. It's coming from, you know, either fracking or, you know, hydroelectric power or wetlands or rice production. And so, you know, it's kind of like, well, it's not even making an impact anyway. But even if you accept that it is, um, there are ways to mitigate that. And so we can, you know, we can feed the animal algae. We know that they get a particular type of red algae, their methane, uh, production goes down by 90 percent. So mm -hmm. you know this is a solvable problem within the framework without having to throw the baby out with the bathwater and right. malnourish a bunch of people. But yeah, I think it's uh, extremely important to, to 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 sort of partition off what you're talking about with when human health. You need to focus on what you know what you're trying to solve with that issue and keep the environment out of it because we we don't know for sure. And, and all of this is imprecise science and all of it is speculation. You know, we look at some of the climate change predictions by the IPCC and they're, I think they're, they're like two out of 105 predictions have come true. So they've been, all, they've been wrong you know, almost 100% of the time. Wow. So it's kind of like, who do we believe long term? Not that I'm saying there's no cause to fix the environment or, 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 to pollu or not to worry about pollution, but I think at the same time we have to put things in perspective. It's a, it's a wonderful point. What do you think about people doing like backyard chickens and backyard goats or buying local, uh, you know, stuff like that? I mean, do you think that's is that where you're kind of talking about where people can, we can maybe offset some of this or? I think that's a great idea for people that can do it and want to do it. I mean, you know, as we see more and more of our population centers are moving to big cities and, and you know, high rise buildings, and this is what's going to happen as the world grows. We're just going to, we're going to grow up into the sky. I mean, that's going to happen. So it's going to be less, you know, maybe you could have chickens in a, on, a, on, the, on the balcony of an apartment or something like that, but it's, it's going to be harder to do for a mass population. So you still have to feed the majority of the people. We still have to figure out that system, but certainly for someone that could do that, mm -hmm. I think it's a great idea. I mean, I think it's fine. Now we have to realize that 
uh, raising your own cattle, raising your own chickens, goats, whatever, is still going to be less efficient. I mean, you're not going to be able to feed as many people, but you can feed yourself. And, and, and that may be your own particular private solution. But I mean, from a worldwide standpoint, we still have to figure out how to do things efficiently, but at the same time protecting the environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, when it comes to lab meat, what are your thoughts on that? So lab-grown meat, so cell-cultured meat. Yeah, so I've uh, talked about this extensively. So currently, let's talk about a regular cow for, the, for, for, for now. So we know that what a cow requires as far as input goes, and we talk, a lot of people talk about the water uh, demands, but about nine, uh, worldwide, something like about 90 to 93 percent of all the water that cattle get is rainwater. I mean, this is the, the, where they get it, and this is used to, what they do when they calculate the water uses, it's like all the water that falls in all the fields to grow the grass counts for water that the cows use, and so it's mostly rainwater. And so they kind of overblow how much water they actually drink that's actually pumped from aquifers or, or things like that, which is called blue water. So there's green water and blue water. But when we talk about lab meat, the process by which they make it today, you know, we, have, we can grow some cells in a culture, but you have to feed the cells, and they have to use something called fetal bovine serum. And so the way that's harvested currently is they have to find, they get a pregnant cow, which they then slaughter, and then while the fetus is still alive, and the fetus still has to be alive, they have to do thoracocentesis, where they stick a big needle into its heart without anesthesia, because if they put anesthesia, it will mess with the serum. So they have to take the blood out of the, the, the fetus's heart while it's still alive after they've killed the mom, suck the blood out, and then they feed it to the cells, and they have to continually do that over and over again as these cells are growing. So it ends up killing all these cow fetuses. So from an ethical standpoint, you know, no vegans are going to support this, but let's talk about now the further in the process. So now you have to grow these uh, cells, and, and they don't just make protein out of the air. I mean, you've got to feed them things. And so where do you get the protein from? Well, most likely you're going to get it from pea protein isolate, soybean isolate. So you're feeding all these things. So how do you get those things? You have to grow these huge monocrops of soybeans and peas and, and whatever protein you're going to use. And that also is less efficient because what a cow can do is it can take grass, which you and I can't eat, and if it gets grain, a little bit of grain, and it actually upcycles uh, the amount of protein that's made. So they take, you know, even a grain-finished cow will take 0 0.6 grams of human edible protein and turn it into one gram of beef protein, which is more. And you can't do, you can't replicate that. At, at best, even if you were at the maximum efficiency with this cell culture, you'd only get a one-to-one -one ratio. You wouldn't upcycle. So you'd need more, more monocrops to grow just about the same amount of meat, the amount of beef. So you would need actually more grain, mm. more soybeans to grow the lab-grown meat. And then the other issue is these cells don't have an immune system, right? So what's protecting them from infection, bacterial contamination? Well, part of it, they have to do it in a big sterile, like beer contain, like a giant, you know, uh, you know, like one of these you tanks, know, big yes. tanks, right? But once they transfer it, transfer it, or even during that process, they have to bathe those things in antibiotics to prevent it from getting contaminated and infected. So all these people talking about antibiotics and meat, this fake meat's gonna have all kinds of antibiotics that it's soaked in to, to protect it from these things. And then also we don't know if they're gonna use the, the correct amount of, you know, you know, protein versus fat. How do they get the fat in there? What kind of fats do they choose? Do they mess with the fat? These cells are immortal cells. You know, we have breast cancer cells going back to the 1960s that have been growing and growing and growing and growing and possibly, you know, mutating. And they've, they've kept these immortal cell lines. And this is what these would be. These would basically be immortal cancer-esque type cells that we'd be feeding people. And so that's, to me, and then also, you know, remember, we've got to, remember, we've got to grow, we've got to put all the inputs into growing the, the soybean and the corn and you know what and the glucose and all the other stuff that we're feeding these cells and then we have to use the fossil fuels to process it and turn it into isolate then we have to transfer it to the to the plants and then we have to run the plants and so it's probably a net negative when it comes to carbon dioxide you know output because you know where cows are putting out methane which is recyclable in the atmosphere these things are putting out pure co2 and the cows remember cows are largely solar powered you know they, they, they don't require uh, they don't require a power cord that is so interesting. So why would people be promoting this? I mean, I know there was, there's been a few books that have reviewed the process. I mean, people are talking about it, saying, well, it's probably better than the meat you get at McDonald's, but it sounds like a very circuitous process and very labor time intensive. Well, I think it is something that they think will be more profitable. I mean, this is, this is the bottom line. I mean, it's, it's generally about profit. Same thing with these plant-based burgers, Beyond Meat, the Impossible Burger. Their goal is to take very cheap products and turn them into highly profitable, uh, and poorly, you know, not very nutritious products that people are wanting. You know, it's all about t flavor and taste. You know, if we're, you know, if we, they think if, if if it tastes like beef, 
and it has the same texture, then we're just gonna eat it because we don't care about our nutrition. Or, or they'll tell you it's more healthy for you when it's really not. But I think the same thing with the cell, cell meat. It's just uh, people trying to carve out a niche so they can make money. And it's, you know, I mean, they'll, they'll try to greenwash it or try to put an environmentally friendly label on that. But if you truly look at the process, you know, it's arguable, it's debatable. In fact, there's been reports saying that the lab meat is not going to be environmentally more friendly than growing beef. Wow. I, I mean, are people trying to push this? I haven't seen, I know it's, it's really in the primitive stages, yeah? Uh, yeah, there's several companies. Memphis Meats is one. There's, there's, there's four or five other companies I think that are doing it. They've got a lot of money. They've got a lot of uh, investment, uh, you know, from a startup investment to do that. There's millions of dollars poured into this. They, I mean, they see the alternative protein uh, uh, sector. sector as a hundred billion dollar industry and it will be and it's just because you know people are going to are going to eat it now it's not going to help them and uh, arguably it'll make them you know sicker but that's yeah. but that's besides the point you know it's always been that way it's crazy I mean for people that live on the coast you know California New York you probably don't they probably haven't seen the monocropping but I used to work in Illinois uh, Chicago area Midwest and, and you drive down in these rural areas and you see corn as far as the eye can see and I mean, you talk about the environmental destruction, what, what that's doing to, to the soil microbiome and all this. I mean, it's really, we, we don't hear that side of the conversation. Yeah, I mean, there's some people talking, but there's a number of people talking about it, but you know, there's some people that estimate we have, you know, 60 years left of soil and then we're, we're done. You know, we run out of food and so we have to uh, do something to regenerate our soil and, and, and clearly running corn and soybeans on the land year after year after year is not doing it. In fact, it's depleting the soil. There's some people that are doing a better job with that, but in general, that is why, you know, particularly grazing animals are so critical to the environment, to, to restoring the soil. And, and that is a, you know, that is something like, you know, if we, if we kick the, 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 you know, kick the can down the, down the street for another 20 years, we're going to run into that issue. And so it's not being long-sighted enough. And I think that, uh, you know, the soil health is something that guys, guys like Alan Savory and other people talk, talk about. I've talked to Alan about that. And it's, uh, you know, it's another, it's another issue. It's not as, as exciting because, I think, you know, there's people that just, they think that by not eating animals or, or, or pretending their animals not being harmed because animals are always being killed no matter what you do. Right. You know, well, no matter what diet you have, there's going to be millions and billions of animals that are killed. And people are sort of, they've got this feel-good notion that this cute little dog or cow or pig didn't have to die to feed me. But in the reality of the matter is there's lots of cute little animals that die regardless of what, what, your, what your eating plan is. And so, Especially in nature leave it to their own devices. I mean, they'll kill each other or get killed by predators and yeah. And, and the way that I've kind of thought about this is animals don't have, I mean, I guess they do have grandchildren, but it's not like a life event for them. They don't even recognize their own children. So it's every day. I mean, with all due respect to the animals, I love animals. We have them every day is kind of the same. It's kind of monotonous. So, so what is, like you said, they're going to die anyway. And every day is kind of the same. So if they live another out their natural lifespan, then what do they get more added value? Do they contribute more to the animal kingdom? It's, it, I mean. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I mean, if we, we could look at ruminants, for instance, and you, we could compare like a domestic cow and what it goes in, and contrary to what some people tell you, they do not spend their whole life in a box. I mean, they're out in field grazing most of their life. Even in a feedlot, they have a lot of space. I mean, by law, they have to have 200 square foot per, per cow, which they don't even use. I mean, it's a lot of room, uh, but, and they live in, in about, you know, looking at stats from the cattle industry, you know, about 96% of cattle that are born will, will reach adulthood. Now, if we look at it, if we compare that to a wild ruminant, like, a, like the white-tailed deer population in the United States, which would be one of our more common wild ruminants, 50% of those animals don't make it to 12 weeks. And almost all of them that are killed are, are usually eaten by a predator in, in not a very pleasant way, or they freeze to death or they starve to death. And so that's very much in contrast. And so the people that say they have, they, they speak for the animals. You know, if you were to ask an animal, would you, would you like to be eaten alive while you're six weeks old, or would you like to live to two years of age, mm -hmm. you know, and be fed every day and protected? You know, and it's kind of like, you know, what would, they, what would they choose? And so I think, you know, many domestic animals, have it better than they would in the wild. Now, that's not to say that animal agriculture doesn't have its problems. And, and there's a big sort of concern with particularly the beef industry. And I, and I tend to preference beef. I think it's a more nutritious food than things like chicken. And they talk about the beef, cattle ranchers talk about the chickenization of beef as, there's kind of, as we have. And the meat industry is, is not flawless and there's plenty of things to criticize. And particularly the way we have, you know, basically three or four major uh, beef packing industries like Tyson Foods, Cargill, and, and JBS, which control about 90% of the beef market in, in the United States, 
I mean, they have very different interests, and they're they're all about profits, profits, and and that's not what the ranchers are doing. And so I think we have to sort of as a community support the ranchers, and you know, kind of get away from the centralization of of all the food. And I think that's what we're seeing. We're we're seeing attempts by these big corporations to centralize all of our food, and eventually. I like to call it human pet food. They're going to turn it all into just basically people chow, you know, and, and, and you know, vitamin enriched, you know, easily, easily, uh, uh, you know, ingested, you know, maybe something in a bar, and that's what we're going to eat as humans. That's going to be our human kibble. You know, there was a study that came out looking at uh, younger folks, you know, younger generation, and they, they found they didn't want to eat cereal as much, and the, the main reason was it was too inconvenient because they had to wash a dish. So that's why they were not eating cereal. They wanted something they could rip into a package and eat. And, and that, that is where we're going to. And so the, the food companies know this, and so they want to continue to do that. And so we have this you know, highly processed, shelf-stable, convenient food that doesn't require any, any effort from the, from the consumer. That's scary. It's a great world. So getting back to the chickenization of the beef industry, I think that's an interesting way to look at it. So as I understand it, chicken farmers, they kind of lease their land, they manage it, they sell all the chickens to big processing. Is that kind of what small ranchers are being kind of forced to do? Is that what you're saying? If we look at the beef industry in the United States, you know, there's 750,000 cattle ranchers, approximately. Most of them are small heads, 40, 50 cattle. I mean, it's, they're, they're not like giant, giant, giant places. And what they do is, you know, a small percentage of them will do regenerative style agriculture. Some will be direct to consumer, some are grass finished. The majority of them will ship their cattle to a feedlot. Uh, and often it's in the Midwest. And so there's transportation because, you know, they, they ship it to where we grow the grain. So most of the grain is Kansas, you know, uh, Nebraska, Iowa, uh, you know, Colorado. And so the cattle are shipped over there. And, and that's kind of the, the current process. And so it's true that most of the, most of the cattle in the United States, probably 90, Five percent are actually finished on a feedlot, and that's and that's just the, the reality of it. And, and there's, I mean, there's reasons that occurs. Uh, you know, there, there's there's significant efficiency in doing it that way. You know, to the cattle industry's credit, uh, you know, we used to have way more cattle in the U.S. 1970, we had about 130 million cattle. Now we have 90 million. So we've dropped our cattle industry by about 40 percent, our, our cattle population. Despite doing that, we produce more beef. We, pr we, use less, we produce less methane, use less water, and use less feed. And so they have responded that way. And so if we look at, you know, the numbers are down by about 30% across the board on everything. So there's been, you know, it's, it's one of the few industries that's actually had a positive role, whereas oil and gas and some of these other companies have just continued to see their, you know, emissions go up for the most part. So uh, I think they'll do what you ask them to. And if we, if we as com con consumers demand we want regenerative style stuff and there's incentives to do that. And so when I see the polit politicians out there talking about we're going to tax meat, I think the better thing is we should reward and, and incentivize guys to do regenerative stuff. Because when you tax meat, all you end up doing is, is uh, harming poor people. They can't afford it. And, and they, won't just, they won't buy it. And that's going to be a shame. And what it does is it'll drive the small farmer out of business because they won't be able to absorb the, the, the increased costs. And so, you know, the unintended consequence, that'll be poor people that can't eat as much nourishing food, small cattle ranchers out of business. We further centralize the food supply and we further make the population sicker. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's, which is not good. Um, now, why the ribeye? Obviously, it tastes amazing, right? But you've been a huge promoter of you know, I don't even know that, gosh, I mean, when I used to go to the store, you know, I was doing a lot of like bodybuilding type stuff. It was a top sirloin, London broil, stuff like that. And then now ribeyes are everywhere. He's single-handedly like <laughs> that kind of meat is, uh, anyway, so, so the fattier cuts of meat, have you found that to be more sustainable on a carnivorous well, I diet? Think, I think when you're on a carnivorous diet, you got to get energy from somewhere, right? So if you're not taking carbohydrates, you know, you, you've got to, you know, I, I consider protein not really as, as an energy source for most people. I mean, you can do it a little bit, but you know, you have to get energy from somewhere. And I think for, for someone like myself, who's at a maintenance standpoint for the most part, I have to get adequate fat. I mean, we know fat is essential. How much you need is, is kind of varies at time to time. But for me, and you know, it, it tastes really good. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, it's a really good, ta good tasting cut of meat. And I, and I think that, and there's pretty good evidence to, to, to show this, that humans spent a lot of time hunting megafaunal animals. We know those megafaunal animals were relatively fatty. I mean, this is where they got their fat supply. And so they would kill the animal, eat the animal flesh, got a lot of fat on there. As the animals got thinner and thinner, uh, you know, so man has always been seeking fat. That's why we developed our big brain. You know, this is what happened two and a half, three million years ago as we went from Australopithecus to, 
you know, Homo habilis and then Homo gaster and Homo erectus and Homo heidelbergensis and Neanderthals and so on and so forth and finally Homo sapiens. Uh, not necessarily in that order, they all kind of interbred. But during that time, you know, early on we probably, you know, as the climate changed, you know, three, two million, three million years, years ago as we went into the Pliocene, temperature drops, climate change, the fruits and the trees are gone, now we have to, we have to survive off the savannas. You know, we scavenge, at first we start scavenging, that's one of the reasons we have such a low gastric pH, you know, we have among the lowest gastric pHs of all the animals in the world, about 1.5, which is about hyena, vulture level. Uh, we were scavenging meat, which was probably contaminated with bacteria, so we were eating that, and that, the, 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 the low pH, uh, high acidity was killing the bacteria. But then we, we figured out how to crack into the marrow, get some of the fat, you know, we found the brains were available to us. That, that started to drive more of our own brain growth. Then as we began hunting, we had these big fatty animals we figured out how to kill. And surprisingly, you would think a man versus an elephant would be an unfair fight. And really, the elephant kind of thinks so too. And so, what happens if you, I don't know if you've ever been to Africa, but if you go down to Africa, I've been to like the Serengeti and Ngorogoro or Credo, you go up and you go up to elephants and they don't run away from you. They just look at you like, what are you going to do, little man? You know, because they're not really scared. And so, when, when humans had developed spear technology, it was, it was, they were sitting ducks basically. And we know that Homo erectus could kill elephants basically at will. So, we had fat, access to fatty meat whenever we wanted it. And that lasted, you know, from about, you know, two million and a half years ago down to about 50 to 25,000 years ago when humans and Homo sapiens reached a critical mass and we just started wiping out the megafauna. And then we ended up, you know, and then we ended up to a situation where now we've got leaner animals, we've got to develop different technology to kill them. Now we've got bow and arrow technology, projectile technology. Uh, we don't have as much fat and so now we're, you know, now we're, you know, still eating the brains and the marrow and then eating more and more of the organ meats because that's where the fat is on a lean animal, you know, you get the visceral fat. And then we're including more carbohydrates and plants. And this is what kind of happens. And so I think if we go back far enough, I think we see that humans probably subsisted largely on fatty meat. That was our energy supply. And then I think the problem is what's a wild human look like? And I would say, I would argue it's not a bodybuilder, it's not a fitness competitor. And so when you want to do that as a bodybuilder, you're gonna, you're gonna intentionally eat lean protein and, and, and relatively low calorie, low fat or low carb, and that's gonna get you leaner. But I think for the average human being, that is okay being 12% body fat, 15% body fat, feeling good, feeling comfortable, fatty meat tends to work well. Now again, the giant metabolically broken obese person is still another subset. And so we have to kind of figure out what works for those guys too. But sure. I think for, at a human at maintenance, I think a fatty cut of meat is a pretty good place to be. Yeah, and it's very satiating. I feel like if you're zero carb for a while, if you don't have that fat, it's, I mean, obviously protein has a high thermic effect. It's very satiating and all that, but I feel like the fatty cuts are really important. That's what my wife and I have found. I mean, there's so many reasons why we, why we need to include enough fat in the diet. And I, again, I, I, you, you know, as part of the, sort of the, as a ketogenic community has kind of grown over the years, we've gone through this, you know, like people call it the butter chugging phase where people were just loading and gorging on butter. And, you know, maybe that wasn't the best idea. And there's maybe too many, uh, you know, I know there's this sort of thing about do calories count or not and, and I think we would both say that yes calories have an effect we have to we have to understand that but they're not the whole picture there's other things that go on there's and, and there's things that you know appetite plays a role obviously you know it's if if, if I am full after eating 2,000 calories of steak and I'm good that's fine but you know it may take me 2,800 calories of junk food to get me full right and so it's kind of a you know it's kind of a different uh, you know different perspective there yeah, are you tracking macros or have you in the last couple of years? I've never tracked anything. I mean, I, you know, I, I track my performance, yeah. you know, things that matter, that actually matter to me, that I, that I care about at the end of the day. I mean, so, you know, if, if I want to, like say I want to get really lean, then I know I just eat leaner meat. I mean, that, that, that's just the way, right? I might eat a little bit less. And I mean, that works well for me. Uh, most of the time, you know, like I said, I'm 52. I, I'm in decent shape and I'm pretty happy where I am. So, I'm, I'm, so I'm, at this point, I'm really, happy to not have to think about food. I've got awesome. other, enough other things that I worry about, so I just eat, you know. Yeah, and if you feel a little weak, you just eat more food kind of thing, and just kind of, yeah. That, that intuition gets lost in the calorie counting narrative, I feel like. People just rely too much on these, these other external variables and, and start, they don't trust their own intuition and their own feedback. Well, I mean, if we were to try to explain a diet to my dog or another wild animal, I mean, you couldn't tell them to count macros or give them a, give them a, give them a macro calculator or, yeah. you know, talk to them about micronutrients and say, you just go eat that. Yeah. And it works pretty well right. and probably worked pretty well for humans for, you know, a million plus years. And, and now we've kind of tried to make it real complicated. Yeah. 
Well, you, and you have to wonder, is it financially driven? You know, all the packaged food from big companies has labels and so forth. So anyway, that's a, a whole nother conversation. But one to finish up on fiber. You know, I think there's a lot of confusion about fiber. If you don't have fiber on a carnivorous diet, all these things are going to happen to your GI tract. And, and some of the data that you were sharing and you have been sharing is pretty illuminating on the fact that fiber may not be, for certain people, that all that healthy. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of purported benefits in fiber. Much of it is population derived, and this is where, unfortunately, much of our nutritional knowledge comes from. You know, population says we observe populations that eat higher amounts of fiber, and they have general, generally better health outcomes. Now, is it because of the fiber, or is that just a marker for healthy behaviors? You know, if you're told to eat fiber and fruits and vegetables, are you a healthier person in general? And I think that's a question that that seriously needs to be truly addressed. And I, and I think you know they try to do it with multivariate analysis, but I don't think they ever fully sort that out. Now. If we were to say, why do I need to eat fiber? Well, people would say, you know, it's because of your mi microbiome or digestive function or reduction in cholesterol or heart disease or, or whatever else, you know, cancer. You know, that's fine. You can say that and you can say that people that eat fiber versus the average person, and again, the average person that we're comparing it to is a standard American diet. That's always the, the, the frame of reference. And the standard American diet is sugar, seed oils, junk food, maybe that's a low fiber diet or relatively low fiber diet. So anything, any intervention compared to that is going to be better. The problem with, you know, saying what happens when you don't eat fiber? Well, I can tell you, you still go to the bathroom. I mean, you, you know, in fact, when I, when we did our study, the average bowel frequency was 1.2 bowel movements per day, which would be about six bowel movements every five days. So, I mean, it's, that still happens. There's no problem with that. Um, we see that uh, gut health in general, and there's a lot of people that are attracted to this diet for reasons of inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's or ulcerative colitis or uh, irritable bowel syndrome. And those guys, almost all of them, get significantly and dramatically better. And so if fiber was essential for good gut function, you know, then we would assume these issues would get worse rather than getting better, and they, they are getting better. In fact, there's, there are a number of studies in the literature that you're probably aware of. I pointed them out. You know, there's a colonoscopy study looking at diverticulosis and you know we saw the people that had the most fiber had the highest problems with disease and the people that had the lowest, lowest fiber had the least problems and the same thing with the you know the, the studies on chronic constipation same thing eliminate fiber constipation goes away increase fiber it gets worse and so there's a lot of conflicting data on actual human intervention trials and most of the most of the pro fiber data is population derived epidemiology intervention trials don't seem to do anything clinically significant. There's some evidence that, yeah, maybe it might lower your cholesterol a little bit. Is that really helpful or not? That's debatable. It might, you know, I think I've seen studies on blood pressure and it, it like reduced their blood pressure by like one point. It's like, is that even significant? Does it even matter? Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, not, I'm, not as in, I'm not as enamored with fiber as, as maybe many people are. I think, you know, in the context of a standard American diet, it's probably helpful. In the context of a carnivorous diet, it probably doesn't add much and may potentially cause problems for people. Because it's more of a GI irritant? It can, yeah, I'd, I'd say for sure. I think for certain people, they, they clearly see that. We know, like we said, like, like say, one of the things they talk about is it ferments. We clearly know that. And for some people, that fermentation process. So here's, a, here's, a, here's sort of a, uh, this is a crazy argument that I'll make, and we can talk about how crazy it is. And so my sort of, sort of uh, postulate is I don't think it makes sense for your guts to hurt. I, I don't think that's a healthy thing. Right? But there are people that say, well, bloating is normal. It's a normal part of digestion. And I would say, well, if I breathe and my lungs were to hurt, you would not say that's normal. If I were to you know, look across the room and I'd have eye pain, you'd say that's not normal. If I were to you know, walk across the room and my knees were to hurt, you'd say that's not normal. But somehow we think it's okay to have gastrointestinal pain, you know, bloating, pain, cramping, normal digestion. That's just normal. That's just normal gas. I don't think that's normal. And we know that eating a bunch of fiber for many people, causes that issue, and I think if if your if your if your intestines hurt, stomach, lower intestines, whatever, then there is either a problem with what you're eating, or there's a problem with the actual digestive system itself, and so you have to figure that out. It shouldn't yeah. hurt. You shouldn't even you shouldn't even have to think about digestion. I mean, I when I eat, I don't even know I've eaten basically. I mean, there's no there's, there's almost no, no there's almost no sensation whatsoever that I can feel going on. I mean, I can go out and you know eat a two pound steak, and then 20 minutes later I can go out and run and jump and do things. So. Yeah. It's such a good point, you know, and I was, uh, to be honest, I, I was in denial after eating, because we, we have a big garden, and um, at the peak of me eating a bunch of vegetables, man, I would have so much GI pain and all this, and 
and I thought I had I, I had these lumps in my stomach. I'd feel like, and it was just probably just a, a big bolus of fibrous compounds. And so I went and ran a bunch of tests, and my alpha feed protein was through the roof, and it chased me down this rabbit hole of three years. But anyway, um, but yeah, so I don't have to. You don't have to. At least me personally, my wife, other clients that we've you know introduced this to, thanks to you and other folks like Amber O'Hearn, um, the, the GI issues have basically gone away. So. Anyway, I think it's important, you know, to hear your perspective on that, and then that kind of gets into the absolute versus relative risk. And I think the average person does; they see the headlines in Scientific Daily or whatever, Science Daily, New York Times. They they don't differentiate, you know, the relative risk, how the the clinical or the significance of that, what that means for someone's health. Yeah, that's a good point. This and this is a funny funny thing that I saw the other day. So recently, there was a there was a headline saying that uh, you know vegan and vegetarian diets increase the risk of hemorrhagic stroke by about 20 percent and you'd see that headline you said oh my gosh don't go vegan don't go plant-based i'm going to bleed out in my brain but the funny thing that i haven't seen before was cnn basically then introduced the absolute risk and then they said that means that about three out of a thousand people will experience effects so you say oh that doesn't really matter right but they fail to do that same comparison when they talk about red meat and cancer and so let's let's go back to uh, the World Health Organization's proclamation in 2015 that red meat, red meat is a class 2 A carcinogen, probable carcinogen, 17% relative risk, and then processed meat 18%, and they class, they class it as a class 1. So what does that mean with terms of absolute risk? So if we know the lifetime risk of you and I getting colorectal cancer, and colorectal cancer is one of the leading cancers in the world, it's like 2 or 3 depending on which, which data you look at. Um, it's four percent or four and a half percent and so if you were to add meat to that diet it would increase that risk from four and a half percent to about 5.3 percent so you're like it's less than a one percent difference you know and so the question is there are a lot of things that could change at one percent and we know that uh, if we just again if we focus myopically on one variable you know and say okay if i eat meat i've raised my risk my absolute risk by one percent or my relative risk by 17 percent i could say well, what else could I do that would change my cancer risk? Well, you could lose weight. You could stop having a big beer belly and, and, and visceral fat. That's going to change your absolute, your, I'm going to see your relative risk by about 300% or 400 or 500 or 600%, depending on which study you lose. You, you read, if you can improve your insulin status, that's another couple hundred percent. If you can uh, get rid of chronic inflammation, that's another couple hundred percent. If you can get rid of IBD, inflammatory bowel disease, it's like 3,000% increase in risk for cancer if you have ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. And the people that are getting rid of ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, they're seeing an actual risk reduction of, of, of that much, which is very significant. So yeah, I mean, the difference is whenever you see a headline that says your risk went up by 20% or 30%, Generally, you should ignore it unless it says 200%, 300%, 400, 500%, because it's really not even worth even considering. And so they've, because they want to generate headlines and they want to continue to get research dollars, we somehow attribute these tiny absolute risk increases as something that's significant when it's really not. You know, same thing we see that with like the, some of the drug companies where they'll tell you that taking this statin will lower your risk for cardiovascular disease by 35% when it's actually like a, you know, a 0.7% reduction in, in a, a, absolute risk, which is like, it's meaningless. It really is. So. A lot of people don't know that. I mean, I got a master's degree in nutrition and we didn't really talk much about that, the differentiation between relative versus absolute risk. And as you were talking right there, a thought came to mind, uh, a colonoscopy. Have you had one recently or no, since going? I have not had one. Um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of mixed on whether that's beneficial or not. I think there's a lot of people that are concerned about you know, is that is that more harm than good? Uh, I might get, maybe I'll get a virtual one at some point. Mm. My father, interestingly, I put him on a carnivore diet about two and a half years ago, and he actually had colorectal cancer. He had part of his colon resected uh, before this, and so he went on it afterwards, and has had a couple of follow-up colonoscopies since being on a carnivore diet, and it's been perfect, perfectly wow. clear. So, uh, and I've seen a number of people that you know, it's kind of interesting. I've seen a number of people that have had uh, things like diverticulitis, and they've gone on a carnivore diet, and they come back, and and that's gone. You know, so we're seeing objective evidence of improvement in the colon so far so I'm, uh, that's so that's uh, and it makes sense you know you think about it if we look at uh, the actual physiology you know when we look at people that have had ileostomies where they've had their colon removed and this is the other thing we talk about how essential fiber is in the colon and overall health well there's people that don't have colons and they live normal healthy long lives and, and how do they do that if they don't have these crucial bacteria producing these short chain fatty acids. So you have to say, well, what about these people? You know, it kind of kind of puts a monkey wrench in your whole theory. But 
we see people that uh, have had ileostomies where we can see what comes out when they eat stuff. You know, it goes into a little bag. And it, so what would normally be going in the colon when they eat meat, almost nothing comes out. But when they eat fibrous food and seeds and nuts, all that stuff goes into the colon and it gets into these little pouches and that's where you're getting these nidus for inflammation, infection, they become diverticulitis. Mm. I've heard some crazy reports from clients having um, different seeds, gosh, what was it? One was a sesame seed, they had some sort of smoothie and then another one was the chia seeds. Yeah. I think those can be particularly, and that's touted as the superfood, right? right? Because it has whatever else. And, this individual like had like a, a, a fistula and all this crazy stuff from a, a chia seed smoothie. This was an end of one. I mean, but to, to me, that was pretty. Yeah, I've talked to I talked to a uh, pathologist who's seen a lot of you know GI pathology. And he says very often when he sees uh, colonic diverticula or diverticulitis specimens, there's almost always plant matter mm. stuck, you know, in there. So it's it's pretty obvious what's causing it. It's not meat. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Um, so just to get finished up on some personal questions, do you feel like you have a calling? I mean, you're so passionate about this topic, you know, and um, I mean, you, you're like the perfect person, right? Very physically fit, good kind of poster child, if you will, to help people realize that, hey, this isn't going to kill you, cause cancer, harm your performance and all this. I mean, deep down, because you're, you're sharing a lot of content, which is great, right? And you're writing this book that comes out when people will watch this. Do you feel like a calling or something? Like you feel like- Well, I, I think it's something that is deeply rewarding to me to do. I mean, as, a, as you know, almost two decades as a surgeon, I helped a lot of people. I mean, I, you know, I fixed people's knees. I saved some people's lives when I was in, you know, in, in doing combat trauma surgery in Afghanistan. And certainly I was making an impact. But you know, since I've been doing this, I, I feel like I reach more people, I have more overall effect on people's lives you know I would I would see someone with you know a bad knee you know and I would replace their knee and they would they would thank me and say hey my knee feels better and then two years later they come in their other knee would be messed up and really what I should have done was given them the power to prevent the need for the other surgery and now I think what I'm seeing is we're able to do that you know not for everybody but for many people uh, we're seeing uh, you know people come in and they're like they needed surgery or they thought they needed surgery and then they changed their lifestyle diet included and they don't need that anymore, and, and they've kind of regained their life, and so that's that's what really drives me to do this. Um, I think that uh, you know, in general, our healthcare system, which used to be you know, we used to call it the art of medicine, it's really dissolved, sort of devolved into uh, what I call the disease management industry, and it's really it's it's a business, and it's all about managing symptoms, managing disease, and we're doing it with really expensive band aids. And I think we have to get away from that. I think we really care about the health of our nation, nation and the future of our, you know, our children and our grandchildren. We, we've got to, you know, we can't just keep pouring more money into that system and trying to fix what, what ultimately is a broken system. It's not to say there's not any benefit for the healthcare system, but much of it is not doing what it's supposed to do. And I think, I think fortunately, through, you know, social media and other other outlets, we have the tools to impact a lot of people and change a lot of people's minds and really make a difference. And I think, totally. we, I think we both are. I mean, I yeah. think we're making huge differences in people's lives. And, you know, I've got a buddy who's a surgeon that listens to your show yeah, and he says, I, I love it, I've learned so much for him. And, you know, again, as a physician, you know, a lot of us put a lot of faith in physicians thinking we know everything about health and we know our specialty, but there's a lot we don't know. Sure. And, and it's something we, we can learn from, from our patients and other people. And, and it's fun to be part of that. Yeah, I mean, you bring up a lot of good points, and I think a lot of people focus so much on access to healthcare, but not about revamping the system like you were just talking about. So, okay, you add more access, but if the system is not really getting at what's going on, how does that really help matters? I mean, I, I understand, you know, if people have pre-existing conditions and this and that, and they're getting denied, okay, more access is better, but... Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the whole access question, you know, I can tell you a lot of physicians are burnt out. They're, they're, they, 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 don't, they don't even want to see more patients. It's not that they don't want to help people. They just, they're just stressed out with the volume they have to see and the system just kind of, it's, it's like a, you know, you're on a, you're a hamster on a wheel just turning, 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 trying to generate, you know, revenue for the hospital or the, or the medical practice, you know, doing the administrative stuff, the, the coding and the insurance stuff. And so it's, it's very much, you know, you can only stuff so many people into that system and get quality care. And I think the problem is, again, we're just putting, we're just putting band-aids on people. They come in, get a band-aid, see you in a year, put another band-aid on you. And we really have to, we really have to, we really just have to stop creating so many sick people. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is the ultimate solution. And that, that goes with prevention. And I think, unfortunately, uh, 
prevention has not been incentivized. There's no incentive for a healthcare provider to do much prevention, and and people don't want to pay for it either. And that's that's the problem. And I think hopefully we can we can turn this around with different, uh, you know, just by showing the outcomes and maybe convincing large employers to say, hey, look, instead of sending you down to the local hospital, let's send you down to these guys to do prevention. Mm -hmm. and, and, and maybe we can avoid you losing, you know, losing downtime to work and being sick all the time and, you know, not being productive. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, how do you deal with the haters? Because you've had some crazy threats, man. I can't even believe some of the stuff. And, uh, you know, I get some of that stuff on YouTube too and everything like that. And we can say, oh, it doesn't get to it. But sometimes you read it and it just pisses you off. So, I mean, what do you, how do you deal with that? Well, I mean, you know, I mean, first of all, you realize it's, it's just words. You know, it's kind of the old six and stones may break my net my bones, but names will never hurt me thing you used to recite when you were a kid. But I mean, yeah, like I said, I've been through some pretty tough times in my life, actual physically, you know, demanding and challenging things. So most of the word stuff, you know, you know, ultimately it's who cares. I mean, sometimes, you know, sometimes I turn it around and just make fun of it. And, you know, and, and, that, and that drives interest. And, and, you know, it's kind of funny. I've got, you know, and, and obviously a lot of people that disagree with me tend to, you know, have a vegan diet or, you know, they, they're, they're sort of bought up into that sort of ethical belief. And they think I'm the worst person in the world because I tell people that you should eat meat or more meat. And so, so, but many of those people, funnily enough, will say, you know, I hated you for a year and now I totally support you. And so it's just kind of continually just, you know, sort of pushing out the message. Ultimately, I think the results are going to speak for themselves. Um, you know, I fully realize I got to take a few arrows to, to make progress. That's, that's anybody that, anybody that's, at le any, anybody that's in the least bit controversial is going to have haters. And mm -hmm. that's, that's just part of the, uh, uh, the way society is today and so I don't I don't really get too bothered by it and you know I've got plenty of good healthy outlets like exercise and right. you know family and stuff like that that make that stuff kind of a minor point do you kind of do you limit your phone use or do you have boundaries around it because you know you got the book you got you're working on a lot of great projects that are going to impact a lot of people um, how do you how do you manage your social media time yeah, I mean, so it's honestly, I probably should limit it more than I do. I mean, we probably all should. I mean, you know, it's it's kind of, uh, I do try to, you know, dinner time, you know, no phone, you know, spend time with my kids. I try to, you know, no 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 phone around. I try to, um, you know, try to be as efficient as I can when I when I'm there. And you know, like I said, I I definitely have times where there's none of it. Like when I'm exercising, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to do that. And so it's it's. Uh, uh, but yeah, it's definitely something that, you know, as hopefully more and more goes on autopilot, you know, because a lot of it's been, I mean, it's been a one man show for a long time and, you know, it gets, you just kind of, you can't keep up. And, you know, at some point, uh, fortunately, there's been some wonder people, wonderful people in the, in, the, in the community that believe in what I'm doing and have been helped by it that have actually started to, to volunteer to help to take some of the pressure off my shoulders. And so I can kind of, you know, maybe just manage more than just you know, be the front line guy, but I still have fun. You know, I still have fun on when I do some of this stuff. It's probably really rewarding, satisfying, like hearing, reading some of the stories and, and seeing some lives change and all that. Um, yeah. So you got the carnivore training system. You got the book that that's coming out. Uh, is it, is mid November? It'll be out on November nineteenth. Yeah, it's coming out. Uh, you know, in print version. I think it'll be available around the world. I think there'll be an audio version shortly after that and then probably an electronic version as well so victory belt uh, via simon and schuster are going to be publishing it so hopefully it'll get pretty good uh, distribution a lot of people will uh, check it out and i think it's a good um, sort of overall introduction how to rationale behind it for a lot of people because I, I, I i'm still you know even though i've reached a lot of people we've probably only touched you know not even a tenth of a percent of, of, of the population that, that knows about this and so my neighbors know about it <laughs> yeah. they, 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 they tend to do it they, 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 they like uh, coming to my house because they get to eat steaks that's awesome that's amazing um so if you were to bump shoulders with a politician you know in an elevator maybe you've had these conversations about policy level change where's the practical starting place where where what how would you ha what sort of conversations would you have? well i think the i think the overall picture from my perspective is what we just talked about is you know changing the focus of, of where our healthcare system is i mean like i said you can you can demand access and, and funding for it but what are we funding? What are we giving access to? I think that has to be the underlying thing. We have to, I mean, we have to fundamentally transform, uh, you know, our food and, you know, our, our prevention efforts. I mean, I think that has to be the number one thing that we, we focus on because a sick, weak populace is not going to be great again. It's not going to be strong. So whatever political spin you want to put on there, you know, we've got to have healthy, we've got to have a healthy population. Yeah.
That's a great point. And your book's going to dive into that. And, and do you offer training, carnivore training systems or t system, does that offer training to healthcare practitioners? Because I think a lot of healthcare, I get emails from folks all the time, like, Mike, I'm, I'm so confused. I read Annals of Archives of Internal Medicine, says one thing, JAMA says one thing, and then all you people on the internet say another thing. Do you have anything in the works for that? So it's kind of funny, I've got a, we're, we are right now, we're compiling a lot of the research articles because you know, there's, you can find research to support really any argument. And so we're kind of supporting, finding the, the data and I've got a cardiothoracic surgeon that's helping with that. Uh, that's in process for another site that'll be coming out and I'll, we'll talk, you know, I'll, talk, I'll announce that soon. Uh, we're going to uh, uh, have stuff for providers. Uh, you know, I've got some material on there with, you know, related to diet and nutrition. You know, again, it's it's not telling somebody how to operate or anything like that. But this is all focused on that. So that that's in the works right now. Cool. And they'll just follow you on social media and your website to to learn more yeah, about that. Yeah, I'll I'll make announcements when that stuff that's is awesome. when that stuff's live. Dr. Baker, really appreciate you coming on the show. Keep up the great work and the inspirational videos and keep up your fitness stuff. I think that inspires a lot of people because in the keto space, exercise has been underemphasized. You know, I'll just, you know, eat your fat macros or this or that and fast. And I, I love exercise. I think that creates that, that demand within the muscle tissues. So I just want to thank you again for inspiring me, many other people. My wife, she's been mostly carnivore, I would say, eight months now. She's transformed her physique and all these other women now are like, wow, it's crazy. So. Uh, keep up the great work and very grateful that you all are still here. I hope you enjoyed this video and hit that like button if you did and I'll be following the comments below and definitely check out the book in the YouTube description. We'll catch you on a future episode down the road.